My name is Clement Sedmak, and I'm director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Our institute's mission is very simple. We want to bring Notre Dame to Europe and Europe to Notre Dame. We do this recording today in a very special location, and we bring Europe and Notre Dame together in a very special way today. We are recording our conversation here at Kyle Moore Abbey in Ireland at Notre Dame's Global Center, a magical location. It is a conversation with three eminent scholars of modern European history, to my right, as you can obviously discover. They are not only eminent scholars, but also accomplished writers and prize-winning authors. That is why we decided to call them our sages. Kylemore Entry, if you ever come to this wonderful place, has a plaque where it says, Sedes Sapientiae, and today it has become true, thanks to our sages. A sage person has a great understanding of people, places, and situations, and shows sound judgment. Our three sages here on stage have demonstrated this wisdom in their award-winning books. I will introduce them in a minute. They've all been awarded the Laura Shannon Prize. The Laura Shannon Prize is one of the preeminent prizes for European studies. It is awarded annually to the best book in European studies that transcends the focus on any one country, state, or people to stimulate new ways of thinking about contemporary Europe as a whole. The Laura Shannon Prize has been created by Laura and Mike Shannon. We first awarded the prize in 2010. Laura Shannon, a member of the Nanovic Institute Advisory Board, came to my predecessor, Jim McAdams, at one point and said, I want to do something really serious for Nanovic, something that people will really understand the importance of, for scholarship and for students. What about having some kind of prize, like a book prize? Laura was uh, a lover of books and literature, especially French literature and culture. My predecessor, Jim McAdams, thought that this was a fantastic idea, and we will all here agree, I assume. So the Nanovic Institute is particularly indebted to Michael and Laura Shannon for this generous gift and the vision for creating it. Laura Shannon, our dear mentor and benefactor passed away on August 7, 2021. We are recording this in August 2022, almost to the day a year after her passing. Her legacy continues, and that is why one way to express that is our conversation. This conversation is part of a seminar which we called the Laura Shannon Residency in Kylemore. It brings together Laura and Shannon Prize winners, graduate students, Notre Dame faculty members, and some special guests. It is a week-long reflection on the art of writing and the art of storytelling. Led by our three sages, our three Laura Shannon Prize winners who are here with us, we want to explore the art of writing and the art of storytelling. Now let me uh, introduce our three um, prize-winning authors in the chronological order of their awards. Mark Thompson, to my right, is a reader in modern history at the University of East Anglia. He worked as a journalist and media researcher in Croatia, as a policy analyst and political officer for the UN's peacekeeping operations in former Yugoslavia, as the first secretary of the media task force at the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe, and as the Balkans Program Director for the International uh, Crisis Group. He was awarded the 2016 Laura Shannon Prize for his book, Birth Certificate, The Story of Danilo Kish. Welcome so much, Mark. Our second sage to the far right is Max Burkholz, Associate Professor of History at Concordia University in Montreal. Between 2011 and 2017, Max was associate director of the Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at his university. He studied modern European history at Pittsburgh, where he discovered his interest in the Balkans and began to study Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian languages. In 2019, he was awarded the Laura Shannon Prize for his book, Violence as a Generative Force, Identity, Nationalism, and Memory in a Balkan Community. Welcome, Max. Finally, Eleanor Gilbert is a associate professor of history at the University of Chicago. She specializes in the history of modern Russia and the Soviet Union. 
With a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, she's particularly interested in Soviet culture, society, and their international context. Her research interests and uh, activities have been disrupted, deeply disrupted, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine this February, and our sympathy is with Eleonori for this disruption. She was awarded the 2020 Laura Shannon Prize for her book, To See Paris and Die, The Soviet Lives of Western Culture. Welcome, all of you. So our format is very simple. We uh, want to invite our sages uh, for an initial preliminary statement of about five minutes, talking about your book and the writing process, and then engage in a conversation. We will cover writing, the art of storytelling, and at the end I would like to ask you uh, to help us with advice for graduate students. What would you uh, give as tricks of the trade for graduate students? So thank you so much for listening to this introduction, and may I please give the word uh, to Mark to talk a little bit about your wonderful book, Birth Certificate, and the writing process which you have survived successfully. Thank you very much, Clemens. Thank you, um, thank you for this invitation and uh, for this wonderful um, location that we're all in and all enjoying so much. Um, I thought I should just say a minute, a minute's worth or so at first about writing for me more generally before it came to that book. Um, as far back as I can recall, uh, writing and reading have been utterly intertwined and I'm sure that's true for all of us here in different ways and the education I had fostered that and when the time came to choose a university uh, topic, a, a, a degree subject. I just wanted to do more of the same. And um, writing about reading uh, um, was what I then did. Um, I found at university that the gap between my abilities and my ambitions uh, widened very worryingly. And I could not narrow that gap, let alone bridge it during the undergraduate years and um, that caused a lot of bafflement which it really took years to um, to understand properly and resolve um, but I didn't spend those years after undergraduate study as a postgraduate I didn't do any postgraduate work and let me say now that I've never written a dissertation but this will not stop me dispensing advice um, <laughs> later on this morning um, my path to writing lay through journalism um, and translation, and it was a question of getting up confidence, really, to feel that I could attempt a book. Uh, it was a matter of um, reaching the point where I felt that I had the right to try and do that. I, I don't know quite why I felt like that. I'm sure it's not unusual. Um, but it was very important to reach the stage, in fact it was indispensable, to reach the stage where I thought I, I had the right to try. Um, and when I did, I found that, um, that the examples of a number of writers uh, were, um, were inspirational. Um, and without the inspiration of a number of writers, some dead, some alive, two or three of whom I, had, I was able to meet and in one case get to know a little uh, was um, um, essential. And it was a relationship with no anxiety at all. I'm thinking of that phrase, the anxiety of influence. Not at all. There was no, I, I didn't want to imitate them, I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to learn about paying attention to things, uh, about relating things to each other, about, um, about uh, um, interpretation, um, about how to put myself in the frame or keep myself outside the frame, and then also the nuts and bolts of composing sentences. So uh, that was all, that sort of apprenticeship, um, I suppose, continues. Uh, one, one never feels one's um, uh, um, uh, uh, beyond that. Um, and maybe the relationship with those, with, those, with those figures alters. They become sort of points of touchstones, really. Uh, but they remain very important and, and central. And 
Um, when I decided to write uh, about Daniel O'Kish, um, I, I, I knew I wanted to write about him before I knew how I could do it or whether it could be done at all. And for years, I moved around in a fog, really, of, of, of a wish to write about him and, and of not knowing how to attempt it. All I could do was gather information about him and read and reread him and think about him. And that was a great pleasure. It was really a pleasure to think about him. And, it's, and it remained so throughout the long years when all this was gestating. And, uh, and sort of marinating. Um, I was working for the UN for some of that time. I, had, I was lucky I could move around that uh, sort of tormented country. And wherever I went, I would, I would, I would look up people who knew him. And uh, so I, I, I was keeping notes. Um, one day um, in Belgrade, after spending hours looking at Kish's books, which were kept in the uh, Serbian Academy of sciences and arts. I was walking around central Belgrade just mulling over my entire situation which was not promising regarding a book and the point of all this was to write a book when the idea came to me that I, I might structure it around this autobiographical text of his. And once I knew, once I decided to do that everything else fell into place. So once the structural key had been found um, uh, then it was a question of doing it. Then it was a question of joining up dots, and it was blissful to be in that position after so, so much uncertainty. Um, perhaps that's five minutes? Wonderful. Would you like more? Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. So I take this insight. You have to get the confidence. I can write the book. You have to work towards this confidence. You learn from the example of inspirational writers, an apprenticeship, as you put it, that never ends in a sense. That's why I think it makes sense to talk about the art of writing, where Aristotle would remind us, well, you need um, um, role models and masters. And then you, you, you mentioned gestating, marinating, mulling over, which I, I think is a uh, very nice way of describing the process until you reached, as you put it, the structural key. And once you found the structural key, it opened the door and then you walked just straight into this room of writing. Thank you so much, Mark. Max, how was your experience writing this beautiful book? Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and to, uh, to discuss this process. Um, I think maybe it's best to just tell uh, two stories as to how the origins of the book, uh, how the book began with a, at a time when I didn't know I actually was going to write this book. Uh, but when I look back retrospectively, I can see that that's, I can identify the moments when the book actually began. Um, I had a vague sense when I was a doctoral candidate that I wanted to write a dissertation, which I hoped would be a book one day, about violence and memory in the former Yugoslavia. And I had prepared grant proposals and been awarded funds to come to that, to travel to that part of the world. And I was looking in central archives at institutions, uh, organizations. Um, but the moments that were of the greatest influence upon me were, would be when I would discover uh, shards, uh, moments in time uh, in the archives of incidents that had taken place in smaller, in villages or smaller towns. Uh, where it was clear some dispute had taken place or there was some uh, painful episode that was unfolding. You could see it behind that bureaucratic language. Uh, and it was in those moments when I would begin to get a sense of uh, there are stories to be told that were not going to be found in the main institutions. Uh, and one of these moments was in uh, Sarajevo in the September of 2006. Uh, when I was looking for permission to examine files for a veterans organization and the archivist kept saying to me they're here we just can't find them uh, and I, I, I had learned through several years of work that you simply just need to keep bothering people and pestering people and being politely annoying uh, so I would arrive at the archive every morning and ask have you found these documents 
Uh, and at a certain point, I heard one of the archivists say, I'm tired of looking at this person. Let him go down into the basement and look himself. Uh, so uh, I think the words were, the Burkholz guy is here again. Get him out of here. Send him down to the basement. Uh, so an archivist basically broke protocol and took me down into this uh, enormous depot in the basement. They, she opened up a steel door, uh, turned on the lights, most of which didn't work, uh, and told me, uh, I think the files may be you know, that way, uh, and you have about 15 minutes. Um, and I remember she handed me a flashlight and, uh, and said, um, 15 minutes. I asked why only 15 minutes, and I heard her just say as she walked away, because I'm going to coffee with my colleagues in 15 minutes. That's all the time you get. And I managed to discover a pile of documents uh, that had been uh, written in the 1980s. Um, I told the archivist that I was ready to go back upstairs. This is all within the 15-minute period. And as I began to read, I discovered the name of a town and information about a very serious uh, act of massacre that had taken place with language and words that initially uh, my, my initial reaction was almost a physical sensation. Something terrible happened. It was not clear who had done what to whom, uh, but it already felt to me like there was a story within these three or four sentences that needed to be told. Uh, and I remember standing up in the reading room and walking around for a few minutes, almost feeling like there was electricity moving through my body. Uh, and this was, in retrospect, this is, this is where I think the book began. Uh, a few days later, I decided to go to the central bus station in Sarajevo. Uh, I bought a ticket to a town about eight and a half hours away, more like nine and a half hours, uh, and traveled out there. Uh, when I got there, uh, I stayed in a small hotel, and I asked if there was a bus to take me down to this town. Uh, they said it wasn't working. The lines were closed, and, but the owner had a brother who had a car who would be able to take me there. And so five or ten minutes later, an old uh, Volkswagen showed up, uh, belching exhaust. Uh, I jumped in, and about an hour later, we pulled over next to a gorgeous emerald green river uh, on a foggy morning, um, and there we were. I got out and I started walking across the bridge over the river and an old man with a cane was walking toward me. And I was the only person on the bridge aside from him. And he immediately identified me as a foreigner and just simply walked toward me and said, why are you here? Uh, and I said, I heard something terrible happened in this town in 1941. Uh, do you know anything about that? And he just stared at me for a moment and said, come with me now. I can introduce you to people who survived. And this was the second moment where I felt like this is the new archive and this is the place where the story, uh, I found the place where the, sto the story is that I want to tell. Uh, and I didn't have a sense of what the chapters were going to be and I didn't have a clear sense of what my academic engagements were going to be in terms of argument and theory, but I felt as if I had arrived at the beginning of the story. Uh, at that point, it was supposed to only be a part of the doctoral dissertation. It eventually became the entire dissertation. Uh, and then I rewrote the book completely anew, having gone back to that place uh, for many years once I became uh, an assistant professor. But those are the moments. I think for me, the writing process, there's a whole, I could say a lot about the day-to-day -day practice of writing and what that looked like. But for me, that process uh, cannot begin until... I have that sense, uh, not an intellectual sense as much as it is almost a, uh, a physical sensation, uh, a sense in my chest of my heart pounding that took place in the basement of the archive and then on this bridge that this is a story that matters to me that I want to now pursue and try to tell. Thank you so much, Max. So, so both you and Mark have talked about there's this kairos when it's, it makes sense to start writing. And there's a process uh, that leads up to this, up to this kairos. And when, when I listened to you, I thought there are these, these several steps. In, in your case, curiosity. You were vaguely interested in something. And then the persistence. How did you put it? Politely annoying. So we can write this down. Be politely annoying. Keep bothering and pestering people. And, and then the third step was the good luck. 
I mean, the persistence brought you to the 15 minutes she gave you, but then it was good luck that you found within those 15 minutes uh, something that you were or were not looking for. Um, and then uh, you, you had this phrase, this, there was a story that needed to be told. And then we begin this kairos, and step number five is the encounter with the person. And as you said, this was my new archive. Encounter, and, and if I may use biblical language, the exodus. So you leave one archive and move out into another archive, and then it's, it's ripe uh, to have a story uh, being told in the writing process. Thank you so much. Eleonori, so you wrote this wonderful book, To See Paris and Die, which has uh, won uh, many awards. And um, we did talk a, uh, already a little bit about the writing process, and some of the words you used were uh, painful, uh, even torturous, uh, but the book reads very well. So uh, how do you connect a painful experience with this beautiful book? Um, thank you, Clemens. Um, that is um, actually something I wanted to uh, focus on that's the kind of the nitty gritty details of the writing process itself. Um, uh, but before I do that, I uh, wanted to express my gratitude uh, to you, Clemens, to Monica for um, the inspired idea to bring us here and to organize this event. Um, to um, Notre Dame for um, continually pushing the the intellectual boundaries of Europe, of what Europe means. And I think all three of us here um, represent a Europe um, that is so often on the margins of general narratives. Um, and the Institute does a very important job in expanding um, those, those boundaries um, to include our part of the world. Um, I also wanted to make a perhaps a dis disclaimer um, I think like Mark, I'll be able to offer some advice, but I want to say that writing is uh, deeply personal, um, very individual, uh, that what works one for one person may not work for the next. Um, you spend much of your life um, learning how to write. Uh, you unlearn and learn again and do it many times over. Um, it's uh, not finite knowledge, you revisit it all the time. Um, the skills escape you just as you feel that you've mastered them. Um, it's not theoretical knowledge, it's very physical, it's physical work. Uh, in addition to being intellectual and aesthetic, it's also physical and sometimes backbreaking labor. Um, I can imagine that there are people who write in inspired fits of imagination, they're very lucky. Um, but for most of us, again, it is uh, work, and ultimately, you yourselves, with whatever lessons you derive from this experience, you yourselves are the best teachers of uh, of writing. You know, you learn by doing it, uh, by doing it over and over and over again, and you learn by trial and error. And uh, this particular book is um, a result of trial and error. Uh, for every sentence, uh, every word, every paragraph that works there, there are countless iterations that did not work. Um, and perhaps the reason something works in that book is precisely because there were so many iterations of the same sentences, the same paragraphs that simply did not, did not work. Um, so with that, be bearing that in mind, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the writing process and its connection uh, to the research process and to the uh, documents um, and to the way we gather, uh, we gather evidence. Um, my first reaction when uh, Monica emailed me was surprise because I didn't quite envision myself as a, tori a storyteller. Uh, and, and I think one, uh, perhaps one or perhaps the main reason I didn't think of myself as a storyteller is that I was, um, trained as a historian uh, at a time and in, in undergraduate and graduate programs uh, where we were under great pressure to articulate arguments, uh, to articulate uh, what is the point, uh, why are you telling this story? There were many episodes or stories that I was attached to, that I liked, that I found attractive, uh, emotionally appealing. Uh, but the readers of my, on my committee 
uh, the readers of my grant proposals wanted to know why should they care about the story. Uh, this is a particular genre that we are all encouraged right, to, uh, to think about, to explore, and to write in, um, so in terms of argument rather than uh, narrative. Um, and I think this was at a time when argument and narrative uh, were the, the relationship between argument and narrative was debated in the historical profession. Uh, they were often seen as opposing ways of writing history. I think we've moved, as we talked the other day, we've moved past this opposition. Uh, but at that time, uh, the, the two ways of, uh, of creating uh, academic histories were a storytelling, narrative, or uh, argument thesis driven. Uh, histories. Um, my introduction to storytelling was largely in historiography courses. Uh, this is where we read Arlette Farge, Natalie Zeman Davis, Carla Ginsburg, uh, Robert Darton. This is where we read microhistories. Uh, if um, those of you who are familiar with the genre, it usually begins of microhistory. It begins with um, a lucky find with a file a file that sets you on a trail of looking for other evidence, uh, perhaps a cor court file, an inqu inquisition file, um, a detective investigation, and then from that it, you know, the story evolves and, and uh, you unearth uh, the past, as it were. Um, now, some years later, when I was working on my dissertation, I realized just how formative li that literature had been, uh, that historiographical literature had been, for, uh, for my own work. Uh, but again, at the, at the time when I was beginning, we were under the pressure to produce argument thesis driven work uh, and not pay so much attention to, uh, to narrative. Um, one of the uh, key debates at the time uh, was between uh, two British historians, Lauren Stone and Eric Hubsbaum, uh, about the return of narrative. This is the 1980s, the return of narrative uh, uh, in the historical profession in academic writing. Um, and Lawrence, Lawrence Stone di diagnosed uh, the um, decline of big history, why, you know, big history, why history, and the emergence of narrative history. Uh, Stone defined storytelling by chronological arrangement and uh, coherence, uh, by concentration on people, uh, may not be great people, famous people, perhaps these are ordinary people, but nonetheless characterization, kind of a human interest story, uh, and uh, by a, a, a history of events rather than social forces. So not necessarily epochal making events, but um, perhaps intimate events, personal, familial, uh, but events nonetheless. Um, and in response to um, Stone, Hobsbawm argued uh, for the possibility of generalization, that we can use events uh, and human interest stories uh, to illuminate the wider uh, world in which our actors uh, existed. So already, um, already before going to the archives, I kind of struggled with this question of narrative versus argument. Um, and already in the early stages, I began to link the organization, the structure, uh, of my material to the arguments. Um, yesterday, we talked uh, a, a little bit about uh, different ways of note keeping in the archives, different um, conditions of archival work, and different kind of idiosyncratic memories that uh, kind of how our memory as human beings, as researchers, functions. And then how and when our arguments evolve from these rather prosaic conditions. Um, so in the archives, I became convinced uh, that the way, and my subject, the subject of the book is Western texts uh, transmitted, mediated, translated in a very new uh, context. Um, I became convinced that the way that Western texts appeared in the Soviet Union, these channels of importation, were absolutely formative for reception. So summit diplomacy, uh, big time negotiations, international tensions uh, defined what boys and girls like me would be able to see in a local movie theater in a very rundown kind of place falling apart. Uh, but again, the big impersonal forces uh, that were happening somewhere out there in the world and that are part of textbooks uh, had uh, intimate effect on uh, cultural reception. Um, and this is when 
the argument and organization, the structure itself and the argument uh, be be became welded in my mind. Uh, so I have this kind of tripart structure that begins with uh, diplomacy, uh, proceeds to mediation and translation, and then finally looks um, at reception. And I try uh, to, in most chapters, to carry through uh, that uh, structure. And one of the challenges um, of this kind of uh, work um, is that um, the, the documents I was, you know, microhistories begin with an event, a place, a file. I was looking at, uh, at thousands of files, uh, all of which seemed equally important. So how do you privilege and what do you privilege? Uh, I was looking more over, and I, I should say kind of as, a, as an aside, a confession, that the sheer volume of the material made analyze, you know, analytical work and writing <laughs> very challenging. Um, but not only the sheer volume, the fact that uh, the sources were so different in nature. Right? Some were very intimate, soul-bearing biographical, autobiographical letters. Uh, some were very impersonal. Some were top top-down decisions from the Central Committee. Some were bottom-up discussions in local party cells. Um, they all had different languages. The nature of the source, some were visual materials, cinematic, uh, textual, material. Um, so the, the different nature of the source was um, a particular challenge. Um, and I struggled with the question of, um, do, different, do documents in different emotional registers require different narrative voices? Uh, this is perhaps when I started being a little more self-conscious about myself as a writer. What voice do I adopt when I talk about uh, diplomatic negotiations, minutes of diplomatic negotiations, versus a, a very personal letter from a teenager, for example? Um, in the end, I decided to maintain a consistent narrative voice, but at the same time, I read these sources, uh, different types of sources, of course, differently. Uh, and that difference required, or that narrat those narrative strategies uh, required further, further thinking. Um, I allowed the documents to guide, uh, to guide my, my reading and writing. Uh, the reason I, I mentioned, I, I mean, I know this might sound as kind of a, an insignificant uh, point, but it was actually uh, something that my advisor and I revisited, discussed almost obsessively. Who guides whom? The documents guide you as a scholar, or do you, and you allow yourself to be overwhelmed by them? Do you follow the documents, or do you guide the documents to say what, you know, what your arguments are, where your interpretation is, where you want the documents to go? Uh, in the you know, in these discussions, I decided, or as a result of these discussions, um, I decided that I will let the documents guide me. I will let the documents overpower me. I will get lost in that forest uh, and hopefully emerge, make my way out of it. Um, so I, you know, it was a very conscious analytical strategy that the doc that I privilege the documents. I listen to my subjects. Um, as the last. Um, the last thing I, I, I want to, um, to mention um, in the actual writing process is um, how you transform or translate the, the, a mass of these very fragmentary, frag fragmented and fragmentary material uh, into a narrative. Um, you translate it the way I think you translate anything else, step by step, um, one folder and one source at a time. Um, my conception of the project, as I mentioned, determined the structure of each chapter. Each chapter would start with channels, with of officials and, and politics. Uh, I called out the relevant documents and put them in appropriately filed, uh, labeled folders. Each chapter would have mediators, translators, editors, dubbers, interpreters. I called out those documents and put them, you know, labeled my folders, put them in there. Each chapter would have reception. I called out readers and viewers letters, and I put them in appropriately labeled uh, folders. Now, it, it all sounds very neat, but it wasn't neat when I was doing it. Uh, some stories I couldn't tell because I did not 
have sufficient information. Some stories I felt begged to be written, but were outside this neat structure. Uh, chapter two, for those of you who are familiar with the book, deals completely steps outside of that structure, deals with a singular event. Um, I was told time and again by everybody who read the manuscript that I must drop that chapter, that that chapter has to go, that it simply doesn't fit, it doesn't belong. Publish it as an article, just get rid of it. I nodded, I thanked my readers, I kept the chapter. Um, I wanted to make sure then that I convinced the readers that the chapter belongs. I don't know if I succeeded. I started each chapter in the beginning. I wrote up one folder, one set of documents at a time. The next day, the next. I reread the documents every day. I reread my own writing uh, from the day before every day. And as I reread, I asked myself how each example all or each little story contribute to the big story. Right? What is the connection? Uh, if it didn't fit, I had to cut it. If I was so attached to it that I couldn't hot, cut it, I highlighted it and returned to it with the same question. Um, I saved every, every cut I made and sometimes I returned certain cuts. Many years later, I returned them to the text. Um, the favorite archival moments that I remember were the ones where I would uh, get different perspective, different voices, a complete story. There would be this and the other and the next and I could tell the whole story beautifully. It was perfect. I anticipated writing those stories. I was excited. I couldn't wait. I wrote it up. I had to drop them because they were stories within stories or within the big story that were a distraction for the reader. Uh, they simply did not work. They had to go. Um, the analogy, perhaps the, the analogy that I'm thinking of when I think about the writing process is one of chiseling, chiseling stone, uh, chiseling out a sculpture. Um, as a as a child, I had attended uh, art school, and we were taught how to make prints, how to carve uh, in linoleum and make prints. Uh, you draw your picture, you erase and draw it again, uh, and uh, until you get, you know, the, the vision to the, pa the the picture on the on the paper to match the vision, and then you transfer it onto the linoleum and you start carving one little bit by little bit. Uh, some are big areas. Uh, and you need uh, a different carving tool. You need a, a, a larger carving, uh, carving tool. Uh, some are very precise uh, and detailed ones, and you need a, a finer cutting tool. Um, and sometimes the cutting takes so very long that you pr forget what the big picture looked like. And then you go back to your drawing, uh, and you revive it in your memory, and you remember when you, why you wanted to make uh, that picture. Um, in other words, all kinds of life experiences are, are useful when you're writing. Thank you so much, Eleonori. Um, so much, so much content here. What kind of knowledge uh, is the knowledge we need to write? And you said it's personal, it's elusive, it's not theoretical. So that, that's an interesting question, what kind of knowledge uh, it is. The question of the framing, why tell the story? There may be a personal response to this question and the, and the wider scholarly response to this question. Uh, the aspect of the structure and, and the way you described your process, you, you have your structure and then things could at least be uh, ordered, if not falling in place. The, the question of guidance, who guides whom? I was intrigued by that. Uh, do the documents guide me or do I guide the documents? And then the question of order, consistency. And I love this idea of we're looking for metaphors for writing, chiseling and carving. I remember Ludwig Wittgenstein, who had uh, six months uh, very close from here, um, talked about wrestling, writing as wrestling and trying to find a redeeming word. And so uh, I would like to ask Mark and Max, having listened to Eleonori, whether you have any reactions or thoughts about the writing process? Well, oh, thank you. Um, in response to Eleonori's uh, comments, what, uh, several, several thoughts. Firstly, with regards to the notorious chapter two, you, um, you had a hunch, you had your own private judgment, which I'm calling a hunch, and you trusted it, 
and you stuck with it, and that was that was the right thing to do. Um, uh, their their advice was well meant, but but it couldn't help you over that. Uh, in fact, perhaps it did help you by stiffening your resistance and and your defense of your hunch. Um, I felt, reading Eleonore's uh, extraordinary book, that it's a very generous work. Um, I often, in a slightly soppy way, think about writing in relation to generosity. Um, uh, I'm making little of it here, but I seriously mean it. Uh, there is some important connection, and and I thought that I thought her book was a very generous work. The sheer depth of research, which must have been confusing and painful at times because you're always aware of the other things you could be doing with your time, um, uh, entirely benefits the reader. Uh, um, um, and it is actually, if I can say, worn lightly. Um, and that seems to me a vital uh, attribute of writing to which one warms um, that uh, in the humanities, that that there needs to be a grace about 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 the learning. Um, uh, so uh, we learn. I mean, Eleonore knows the value of black market copies of Russian translations of *The Catcher in the Rye* in the 1970s, and we learn that. But it's we learn it en passant when it fits in a sentence, when it's something that we need to know in order to fully understand. The, uh, um, uh, the matter that's being discussed. So I was thinking of trusting the hunch and um, I'm thinking of the generosity uh, um, which is for which you pay a price and we are the beneficiaries. So thank you. I'm so glad that we are videotaping that. Writing to which one warms. There needs to be a grace about the learning. So we will keep that in mind. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for um, everything you said. It was really interesting to listen to. I think I was thinking about two of the kind of uh, dichotomies you raised, uh, you know, the idea that uh, while you were doing your graduate work, um, some of your advisors were saying, you know, do we write narrative or do we write argument-driven history? As, as if it can be either one or the other. Uh, or do we, do we guide the documents or the documents guide us? Uh, and I mean, I think, you know, the profession is filled with these kinds of debates uh, that are, in my view, kind of false dichotomies. Um, uh, people take up kind of hardline positions uh, behind one or the other, and uh, maybe there's, there's, there's like analytical leverage to be gained by pushing that position to a certain point. But then at a certain point, uh, for me at least, uh, in the writing of my book, um, to tell a story means, you know, the, the writer has to guide the documents to some extent. Um, you have to see uh, some kind of drama, storyline, narrative, almost, uh, you know, I, I sometimes uh, thought as I was walking around the area where I was doing my research and as I was reading my documents as if, you know, could I make this story into a film? And if so, what would it look like? Uh, and what would be the kind of sensations that I would want to emerge out of the sentences? Um, at the same time, you know, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not... Um, I'm not writing literature. Uh, I want the, my book to be argument driven, uh, but I also want it to be dramatic. And how can those two elements, can those two elements be combined? And if the profession or those who are in authoritative positions are saying to me, pick one or the other, I don't think it was until I put the dissertation aside for a few years uh, and I began, uh, I began thinking about uh, dramatic storytelling, and at the same time reading a lot of argument-driven social science literature. So I, in a sense, I left history behind uh, while, while focusing on my own ideas about storytelling and trying to learn about uh, scholarship that in many ways is far more argument-driven than, than, than the, the discipline of history, like political science and sociology. Um, and I think, you know, uh, it's, for me at least, the challenge is to figure out how to find the middle ground between these two dichotomies that you raised uh, that I think are still present in the profession. Um, and, and it's one that I think as historians we have to engage with because to publish books means we have to appeal to readers. And if we're just telling, if we're just trying to articulate arguments and discuss theory 
uh, uh, and, you know, kind of the more technical side in a sense of the profession, that's not going to attract readers who are not, you know, that small group of colleagues that would read our work no matter how we go about doing it. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the thinking of, of a way to guide those documents into a story that is deeply compelling, while at the same time taking up a position in the field, uh, an argument-driven position, like that is the great challenge. Um, and uh, that, that would be the advice I would offer to anyone starting, is that those dichotomies uh, need to be uh, understood as to when they emerge, you know, at different times in the discipline. Uh, the debates need to be read. Uh, and I think to some extent, uh, learn from, from them what you can and then in a sense leave them behind. Because uh, it's, the, it's the fusion, uh, it's a finding a way to, to bridge those, to keep both elements together. To, I, I identify that in listening to, like that is the challenge that I, I became most interested in in writing my book. Um, but it was, it was very stimulating to listen to you talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank, thank you Mark and thank you Max. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, with you, Max, uh, this was a challenge for me. I wanted to do both. Um, I agree with you when you say that we are we should be aware of these dichotomies, but in some sense they're they're false, uh, and we ideally we'd like to do both, and we'd like to do both in a way that isn't that doesn't doesn't bear the device, that isn't that isn't too forceful for the reader that that sits easily with the reader, right? Where the, the reader is, is so engaged with the story we tell that our arguments are convincing without having to be overwhelming, uh, overpowering, and, and perhaps not even too obvious. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I, oh yeah, uh, we, we talked about two dichotomies, narrative versus argument and who guides whom. And, and before we talk about stories more explicitly, and, and Eleanor talked a lot about storytelling already, uh, could we just uh, visit two further dichotomies when it comes to the writing process with uh, special attention to the situation of credit students? And one is the dichotomy between kairos and time pressure. So listening to Mark and, and, and Max, well, there is this Kairos. Now it's ripe. I got the confidence that I can write the book, and now I feel there's a story that needs to be told. But you know, there is this whatever clock is ticking, you know, the, the PhD years clock, the tenure clock, whatever clock is ticking. So how do you connect this dichotomy? Kairos, waiting for the Kairos, which may be in theological language grace-filled and beyond our control. But then, you know, the external pressures, that's one dichotomy. And the other is, um, um, being in the flow and showing discipline. So, so both um, Mark and Max said, well, then it, it kind of, you, you got the structural key and then everything fell into place. That, that's what you said. And also Max, in a sense that um, in a previous conversation said it was almost ecstatic that the writing, I don't say that it was not only pain, also painful for you, but there was this moment of, well, now it's flowing. At the same time, this question of, do you have to be disciplined? Do you have to get yourself to writing even you if you don't feel like. Some people need a pitch black room uh, to get some writing done. Others would prefer Kyle Moore Ireland. Just look outside. Um, and so how do you deal with these dichotomies of, of Kairos versus external pressures and flow versus discipline? Any insights, friends? Regarding graduate students. Regarding those dichotomies. Whatever wisdom you want to give us. Wisdom. You set, you set the bar so high. I, I mean, my feeling, I've already told you that I haven't written a dissertation. It seems to me that writing a dissertation is a job and should be treated as a job. You're doing this for an external reason. You're doing this for certification. And, uh, and um, it might, you might regard it as a peculiar kind of certification, but that is what it is. And therefore... Um, I suppose be as matter of fact about it as you're able to be, given the, given the fact that you are churning with ideas and operating in a field with, with, um, with few, as it were, sort of very fixed markers. Um, take the guidance that's offered, think about and as a push back against the guidance that's offered. And I've, I've heard in the last couple of days you saying how useful it has been, uh, how the guidance that you've got at Notre Dame is, is useful. Uh, this is not at all to be taken for granted, I can assure you, I'm sure you're aware too. Um, 
uh, and um, and 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 complete it as soon as you can, in order that you can then depart from that. In 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 order that that you can then move forward, including including uh, uh, to um, the. Um, the rewriting of the of the uh, of the dissertation for a wider public. We're, maybe we're going to talk about that transition a little more oh, later. But wonderful. that's it. Thank you. I remember a colleague who was hired to write a particular book, which he lost interest in. He wanted to write another book. And the person who hired him said, "Well, but this is what we hired you for." And then he he got the motivation to write it uh, with the image of this is like paying rent. So it's, it's like a job. It's like paying rent. You, you have to do that if you want to stay where you are. And, and uh, so I'm grateful for this pragmatic advice. Any insights into my two dichotomies? I don't know if, I, if I'll address everything, uh, but just listening to the conversation the last few minutes, two, two things came to mind. I mean, I think, um, I was going to say being a historian, but uh, being a writer of... Uh, telling human stories and trying to base them on some degree of uh, truth and reality, so social science or uh, historical research, I mean, inherently requires, um, it's not just a job. Uh, it has to be uh, a deep passion. Uh, discipline is required, but that discipline is different than just, you know, getting up and going to work uh, and paying the bills. Um, I talked yesterday about, you know, um, how uh, both f discovering s the, the subject of my work and doing the writing and to some extent even the research process um, was uh, brought fe you know incredibly positive feelings and were, was very energizing but I could also talk about countless hours uh, of you know um, I'll give an example of, of uh, you know an archive I worked in in Belgrade called the military archive where you know the archive works from nine in the morning until one p.m. and is located an hour outside the city on a military base. You take a public bus for an hour to get there, and then you walk twenty minutes to the entrance of the base. You discuss your situation with the soldiers there with their AK-47s. They let you in, and then you walk two kilometers to the archive, uh, and then you have maybe two and a half hours to research. The temperature outside is 37 degrees, inside is closer to 40, and, you know, you, you maybe find nothing, and you walk back. And, I, you know, hundreds and hundreds of days over years, uh, some days you find things, and that electricity comes, and that's, that's the more passionate side. But the passion is needed for those other days, too. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's not just... Uh, trying to get a job and uh, status and security. I mean, these things matter in life, but this is a, this is a type of a way of life, I think, for me at least, that requires, uh, you know, a sense that this is, um, this is what I was made to do and this is what I want to do and I'm willing to give everything I have and more uh, for the work at hand today and for this way of life. Um, that may sound a bit extreme, but I mean that's that's how it works. That's how it works for me. Um, in terms of uh, the other, the other, well, another issue that came to mind listening to you talk about time constraints, kind of the reality of, of what it is to be a graduate student. The reality I talked yesterday about having um, I needed to stop researching at a certain point because the tenure clock was coming up, uh, and I, at a certain point, my graduate student funding ran out, and I, um, you know, maybe recklessly. Uh, I came to my supervisor at the time when, when I should have been finishing. She was expecting the final version. And I came in and I said, I have to go back to Bosnia. I need more. I don't have enough information. And she said to me, you certainly have enough information. This is a question of interpretation. It's not a question of evidence. And uh, I, it is a question of evidence. I have to go back. Uh, and she reminded me that I was going to run out of funding and that I was uh, going to be in all kinds of uh, trouble and I might have to withdraw from the program and get a visitor's library card uh, and, and be you know, doing graduate work kind of on the extreme periphery uh, where I wouldn't even be registered. I decided to go back anyway. And that, that trip was actually very important in, in, in many ways um, for, uh, you know, in a sense, an important bridge from where I was at that time to you know, years later making this book possible. Um, it was a risk. I, I, uh, the, the stress I felt at that time was less about 
can I write every day? Do I love what I'm doing? It was more like looking around the world where I, where I was at the time and, and saying, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 30s. Uh, I'm writing every day. I have no income. I have the same pair of jeans I wear every day, a bicycle that doesn't work very well. And I look at people around me who are my age and seem to have lives uh, that are functional. Uh, I'm going to keep going anyway. I'm going to take this risk. It's a very risky endeavor uh, to, to both try to do the research and complete the dissertation, but to also then, in a sense, have the, the confidence uh, or be willing to take the risk that it will turn into a position one day. Uh, but that's why I say it's, it's that there's some kind of level of, of passion, uh, commitment, uh, and some level of belief uh, that this is the, uh, the right path. Uh, that I think you know all of us to some extent uh, have to have inside ourselves Thank you just one quick remark before I hand over to Eleonori um, John Henry Newman Saint John Henry Newman as we Catholics say uh, once said that the opposite of a deep truth can be yet another deep truth so we have the job message from Mark, we have the passion message from uh, Max and maybe they are two truths which we can hold together Eleanor, your take on our dichotomies I'll try to hold the, truth, the two truths together. Um, I um, want to echo uh, Max in saying that this is a work of passion. Um, I entered the graduate program to write this book, not, vi not the other way around. Um, I felt since I was first introduced to history that, I, that this is the book I wanted to write. Um, in some sense, I've been writing this book for much of my writing life for much of my life in English, and maybe perhaps for much of my life in general. Um, I'm relieved to have it be done, uh, but, but the practicalities were there, right? Were tools, were mechanisms to do this kind of work, right? I could have done it perhaps outside the graduate program, outside those structures, outside the, the PhD. Um, just that just didn't happen. It happened a different way. But those those specific um, kind of prosaic uh, job-like uh, features of what we do for me were there because this is the work I wanted to do. This is the book I wanted to write. Uh, those were the archives I wanted to be in. And the graduate program, the funding, the deadlines, all of that gave me the opportunities to do to do this work, to pursue this, uh, this passion. Um, I also very much agree on the necessity of risk taking. Um, and it's a precarious kind of situation because we get ever um, fewer years in the programs and ever tighter funding. Um, and yet, we, you know, I, I feel hesitant saying that, but, but I'll say it anyway. Yet, we have to allow ourselves to make mistakes or to take risks and know that maybe there is nothing in that archive and you will have just wasted a day or a week or an entire trip. Um, but, it's, but I think it's a risk worth taking and there are substantial rewards. I had multiple conversations with my own advisors and my committee exactly like you did. I need to go back. I am missing this, this part. Uh, this, these documents don't line up. I need something else. Sometimes I'd say, I don't know exactly what I need, but these things don't fall into place together. I need to go back. And I'd be told, no, you don't need to go back. We don't have the funding for you to go back. Uh, work with what you have. Go back later. I also want to say, um, since we are partly in the mode of dispensing life advice to graduate students, is that... Um, Pressuresome as those time constraints are, I think that, and I don't know if you would agree with me, uh, Max, that this is the graduate years are the time when we have most freedom to do that archival work, to, to make those mistakes, to correct our mistakes, to find something else. Uh, once we're out of the graduate programs, we don't have that much space. We don't have a year or a year and a half to go to the archives. We're constrained by two months in the summer. The archives close at various random points, and we are left with nothing. So that kind of extended time period when you can read, when you can take turns, when you can take risks, when you can pursue that footnote in somebody else's book and discover a whole other 
uh, chain of events, arguments, and logics. Um, I, I think these years in the graduate program are the ideal time uh, when we do that. Uh, we have a lot less room to make mistakes once we are done with our degrees. Um, I also wanted to talk about the, the kind of the flow and discipline uh, and very much echo what um, Clement said. Um, it is a passion, but it's also a job in the sense that, at least for me, I had to sit down and do it, and I had to do it every day. Um, sometimes it wasn't going, so I would read the documents and try to get into the world of my subjects and try to immerse myself ever, ever, <laughs> ever more in that world in the hopes that the writing would flow. But, but here's the thing, it's not gonna flow until you open your laptop and sit in front of your screen. Uh, you have to be physically there and you have to look at the screen and you have to start typing or outlining or reading for anything to happen. So it's, it is passion, it is a job. It's another one perhaps of those faulty dichotomies. Mm -hmm. um, and each of us is going to negotiate those dichotomies differently. Um, it's always a negotiation process. Um, and that process changes, you know, it, it changes in diff at different stages of your career, different stages of your lives, your obligations, but we, we are always thinking about those things, always negotiating it. Wonderful. So let's just, um, as a concluding message of our reflection on writing, say these four dichotomies that we talked about, um, um, argument versus narrative, uh, guidance through documents, guidance off documents, kairos versus external pressures, flow versus discipline, maybe false dichotomies and have to be negotiated constantly on an individual level. And when I listened to Eleanor, um, the words risk, reward, freedom resonated with me. The, the risk taking means there may be uh, resources wasted, there may be mistakes made. Uh, rewards means, and I'm thinking of this electricity that you mentioned. I mean, you need to be refueled through, through some kind of rewarding experiences. So there, there may be walks through the desert and then there's an oasis of success. And, and, and freedom in the sense of you, you have the, the space and the time to experiment a little bit. And that came, uh, that brought one term to my mind, namely resilience. That the writing process requires a certain resilience from the people in, engaged in the process. And as we know from resilience studies, people are resilient if they have a sense of direction and uh, a sense of where they want to go in, in, in the end. Meaning, meaning uh, I, I do want to have a book at, at some point. If it's, if it's, you know, if, if Max were completely free, this book would have been published maybe four years later, if it was not the ten o'clock. And and who knows what what Eleanor would have done with the, the you know the, the sheer amount and vastness of the material. Um, and if you're okay with that, I would like to move now explicitly to storytelling. How could I say no, Eleanor? One <laughs> one one little thing as you were talking came to mind um, when we think about the science the hard sciences performed in a lab, for whatever reason, that risk-taking and dead ends are part, are an accepted part of that experimental ex experience. And I wish it were so in the humanities. We don't have to know the end point necessarily. Dead ends are useful. They foreclose certain roads and lead us to other roads that might yield results, exciting results. So I, I'm not sure why, right, wh why making mistakes is so frowned upon in the humanities. I wish it were part of the profession and part of professional training. And I wish we were told from the beginning, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to pursue something that, you know, leads that don't lead anywhere, because then the leads, you know, the other leads will open up other possibilities. You know what a dead end is, you won't go there the second time. Uh, so go in another direction, right? So it's it's just um, something that I thought as you were talking about about risks and uh, and mistakes. Amen to that, Eleanor. We will we will you know disseminate this video as widely as possible to spread this insight. Also, we people in humanities should be allowed and encouraged to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Now, Mark wants to say something sure. before we move on. Yes. Again, how could I say no? Also prompted by both of you, all three of you. Uh, you mentioned rewards and the need for rewards. That's right. Uh, we, it's very important to feel those with uh, undertakings which 
which are potentially infinite, uh, particularly. Um, but of course, those daily rewards do come in the form of thinking. Thinking about things we love, thinking about things we are obsessed by, um, and we want to resolve in some way. And the thinking, of course, it's an ambiguous reward. Sometimes it's difficult too. A wonderful American critic, uh, Lizzie Hardwick, said at one point, she was very witty, she said at one point, oh, writing is so difficult. It's the only time in your life when you have to think. And um, I think, you know, that's, we, we are, it's something we're drawn back to doing, even when it's painful, because it is so intensely rewarding when it's, when something's working, when something's working. And you don't get to that uh, if you don't open your laptop, as Eleanor said. Wonderful. Maybe an invitation to our viewers and the audience here. There's this little text by George Steiner, 10 Possible Reasons for the Sadness of Thought. It's a very gloomy text. He basically says, uh, why are we getting depressed when we start thinking about things? And the invitation is, take the very same points he makes and say, this is why thinking makes us happy. One argument he has, the, the waste of thoughts. I mean, you are thinking thoughts that have been th thought by so many people before you. What a waste. Everybody should be only allowed two thoughts per day or maybe per month, depending on the country, I guess. And um, <laughs> the idea that, that you think something which has been thought before should be happiness driving because it brings us together as a community, just as a side, and this will probably cut it out of the video, which is a shame. Um, because it's a beautiful text, 10 possible reasons for the sadness of thought. Storytelling, storytelling. Um, the art of storytelling uh, shines through in all these three books in a, in a wonderful way and in very different and personal ways. And could we maybe uh, reflect in the first round on, on four dimensions of storytelling? The framing, the beginning, the cutting, and the ending. The framing, the beginning, the cutting, and the ending. And, and by framing, I mean, how do you draw people into the story? And if Eleanor allows, I will read in my poor English um, the first paragraph of your introduction as an example of framing. Of framing. Before you begin the story, you, you, you basically tell the reader, well, this is kind of the, the, the large view. And the first paragraph of Eleanor's book, in case you do not know this by heart, is, in the mid-1950s, hundreds of Western books, films, paintings, and sounds arrived in the Soviet Union. They arrived during its remarkable opening to the world after Stalin's death and the xenophobia of his last decade. And they came to stay, becoming a defining feature of late Soviet life. For the next 30 years, cityscapes, pastimes, and relationships would be shaped by an obsession with things Western. This is a powerful, very short paragraph that frames the story that you are about to tell. So um, thank you for that. That's framing. Beginning, obviously, um, Max um, and I are soulmates in the sense that I was about to read the very beginning of, of um, the book where you begin your story which you have told us just, just before. So, so again, do you remember, all of you here, the viewers and the audience, what Max said about, well, there was this random encounter in Sarajevo, and then you got your 15 minutes, and then um, the way you described it, and I found that so, so powerful is, um, you got sources together, and each of these sources slowly revealed more about what took place in September 1941 in Kulin Vakuf, but telling that story required the opening of doors to a distant past, and then you basically say, after you have begun the story, this story leads me to another story. And so this is the beginning. And then uh, the cutting, I, I don't have examples for cutting, and you know why? Because I don't know what they cut. Uh, I just know that each book is the tip of the iceberg, and there are many, many more words, paragraphs, sources, and, and, and we all know it from our writing experience, it is so painful. It's like, you know, self-mutilation. I mean, you have to cut something which, which uh, you have warmed up to, and it is, has become part of who you are. So framing, beginning, and the cutting, and we did talk about that also in films, cutting, and, uh, and then the question of how to end the story. And, uh, I thought Mark has this remarkable way of, of ending his story. Um, maybe uh, you can read it yourself because your British accent is so beautiful. Could you read the end of your story, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I can hold your microphone for you. Do you here, yes. Starting there? Yes, please. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> how can I? I'm now very self-conscious about reading. Um, uh, just to set the scene, um, I'm, I'm in the library of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, which itself is an institution fraught with political meanings which, which um, are very ironic regarding Kish's, uh, my subject's cosmopolitan outlook and work because the academy became before and then during the ca ca catastrophe of Yugoslavia a, um, a, a sort of nerve center of, 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 of nationalism, nationalist research, nationalist ideas, nationalist projects. Anyway, so there I am. After a few hours leafing through his books, I was invited into the head librarian's office. As a Serb from Kosovo, she was, and this, sorry, this is just a year or two or three after the NATO had bombed, and uh, bombed Kosovo, and Kosovo had been, had been abandoned by the Serbian armed forces. As a Serb from Kosovo, she was keen to challenge Western misconceptions about Serb-Albanian relations in that contested province. When my attention wandered to a trolley loaded with huge leather tomes next to her book, she smiled for the first time. Diderot's Encyclopedia, she said proudly, a first edition. It had been bequeathed by Marco Ristic, a surrealist poet from Belgrade, who was Tito's first ambassador to Paris after the Second World War. This was a fine coincidence, for Diderot had mattered to Kish from first to last. As a student, he approved Diderot's thought that distance from loss is essential for creating art about loss. And his last book ends with Diderot's vision of posthumous love, quote, commingling unquote, a couple's ashes. From Kosovo's ethnic tyranny to Diderot's enlightenment and beyond, to Joyce, Borges, and a reunited Europe, is almost too far to measure. But it is there, along that spectrum, that Kish's writing shines most brightly. Thank you. What a beautiful ending. And so, um, could we reflect on, on four dimensions of storytelling or whatever else you want to say? You're the sages, I'm just the moderator. We would like to reflect on some aspects of storytelling, framing, beginning, cutting and ending. How do you frame the story? How do you begin the story? How do you cut? Where do you cut? How do you know that you cut enough or too much actually? And, and how do you end it? And whatever you want to share in terms of thoughts about that, I would be grateful. Maybe Max first. Thanks. Uh, for me, the, the framing of, of this book was actually a, a huge challenge um, because I had spent so many years researching this small place that even in Bosnia, uh, many people don't know about. So when I would tell people where I was working, there are, there are many, the, the town uh, that, my, that my book was about or is about is called Kulin Vakuf. But there are many other places with the, the second word Vakuf, like Donje Vakuf, Gornje Vakuf. So when I would say this was the place I was researching, everyone would mention one of those other places. And then I would finally say Kulin Vakuf. And they would just finally say, where is that? Uh, so it was the challenge was how, how do I how do I frame a book where this place that even people in the country where the place is located don't know about how do I make this relevant uh, to the world uh, and that's where I feel like um, again the importance of intuition uh, as I was going deeper into researching this local story uh, I began reading um, far outside my field so outside. Uh, the historiography of Bosnia, outside the historiography of Yugoslavia, outside the discipline of history. And I started reading a lot of social science research on violence, on nationalism. And I think this combination wasn't something that anyone told me uh, or anything that I consciously decided to do. It seemed to be what intuitively felt right, that as I, as I uncovered more and more local details, uh, the work I was doing uh, to come up with questions and in a sense to frame the relevance of the story uh, I was I was reading more and more 
um, in, in, a, in a global sense and outside the discipline of history and, and teaching myself different methodologies. Uh, and I feel like that combination of deeply local but also multidisciplinary and uh, thinking in a more global context is what really allowed me, uh, what really allowed the framing to crystallize. You know, what were the questions that I, were going, that I, that I needed to pose within the first, you know, thousand words of the book uh, that would make a reader who, who's an expert, say, or interested in Latin America uh, or Africa or the United States think that this book could be of interest? Because uh, really, uh, we have only a few pages to hold those readers' attention. You know, this is the big difference between writing a book and writing a dissertation. No one actually has to read. Uh, they, they may stop and never pick it back up again. Committee members have to read. It's their job. Uh, so, so the framing, I was very conscious of how important this was because I had taken this risk of trying to write, uh, you know, a 400-page book about a very, very small place. Uh, but I feel like doing that reading as I was doing my very detailed research is what, um, what allowed me to, to pull that off. Uh, so so that, that's what I'll say about uh, framing. In terms of beginning, um, it's the only time in the book where I actually insert myself uh, into the story. Uh, and because I felt like the, the archival discovery um, isn't just a story that's uh, dramatic and interesting on its own, uh, but it also has something to say in a less uh, maybe uh, direct way about um, how this story was deeply buried for so long. Uh, and the, the kind of the chance discovery and the luck that I had, there's also something incredibly um, tragic and sad in the fact that um, that story was lying there in that basement for so many years. Uh, and and it, it really was just this, uh, you know, 15 minutes where um, I happened to give, be given some very general direction as to where uh, a trace like that might be located and, and, and that it turned into uh, an analysis and a story like this uh, about so many lives lost and so much trauma that has been passed uh, for, for so many decades. Uh, and I felt that that had to be part of the, the, the initial, um, the first sentences of the book. Um, cutting is an interesting um, subject to think about. I, I, as I was listening to the early part of the conversation, I think a lot of the cutting that I did was less cutting sentences or paragraphs. The cutting was actually happening during the research process. Um, for me, um, as I learned more about the story uh, and as the storyline and the, the, the narrative began to crystallize in my, in my head, uh, I think I began to get a clearer sense as to which sources mattered and which ones didn't. Uh, and I was talking uh, with, with uh, the graduate students yesterday about this. When I wrote the dissertation, I went through every document that I had uncovered, translated what I thought was necessary, put them in chronological order, wrote hundreds of pages of notes, like over half a year, I prepared like these meticulous notes uh, and then um, I, I, that was kind of my, my map for the entire dissertation. When I wrote the book, which was not based on the dissertation, I assembled it like almost like puzzle pieces with no outline. I just simply would read documents and I knew where they would fit. I somehow knew where they would fit. Uh, and I feel like that decision-making pro uh, pr process at that point was really uh, another part of the cutting. Uh, you know, cutting, cutting in, a, in a more stereotypical sense is like erasing sentences, writing something and then cutting. Uh, but it's also in decisions about which sources uh, fit and which ones don't. Um, the ending of the book came to me, I, I woke up one morning um, for no good reason, hours earlier than I would normally wake up, and the ending had woken me up in a sense. I woke up, I was in the dark in my room, uh, jumped out of bed in my underwear, grabbed a piece of paper, and began writing. And, uh, uh, and I, there's a little bit of light kind of creeping through the curtains. And three moments in time, long after the story I was telling in my book had finished, came to me. Uh, and I thought to myself, the book needs to end with me tracking some of the big, uh, more abstract processes of violence and nationalism and trauma 
uh, and memory uh, in more recent periods of time. So there was a moment from 1981, uh, the first time in this town when a monument is unveiled for uh, some victims of violence. There's a moment in 1992 when this town was attacked uh, by the Bosnian Serb army and the entire population is, uh, is forced out. Uh, and then there was a moment uh, in, from my research process, I suppose it's the second time in the book actually when I inserted myself uh, without the first person singular where I discuss uh, the landscape of memory, what monuments have been built, which ones have been destroyed. Uh, but that ending, I think, I didn't have the ending in mind until that morning. I really, it was one of the things where I was not sure how to end the book. Uh, but I think because I'd been living so intensely with it uh, during this final year of writing, um, it's it was it, it's a it's a it, uh, maybe the other authors will will share this sentiment maybe not but uh, parts of the book literally would come just bursting out uh, once you're carrying all the chapters together uh, for such a period of time uh, and writing every single day uh, it's it's a uh, it's sometimes aspects just kind of crystallize and that was a morning where the where the ending came to me. Thank you, Max. I don't need to comment everything. So Eleanor, if you want to share your uh, well, I, um, as, as you were telling the story of the, of the way you came up with an ending, um, I, um, I was thinking ex exactly, almost in your words, uh, what then followed, what you, s uh, uh, you know, the, the, the following kind of the, the, the follow-up explanation, and that is, you live with this for so many years. And even when you're not writing, this is part, and, and perhaps it's something that we can talk about, uh, both the kind of our own uh, autobiographies that we bring to these projects and the way these projects shape our lives. But you live with it for so long. It never quite leaves you, even when you're not writing. Um, it's, it's always there, it's always in your mind, it's in your heart, uh, it's in your dreams. Um, sometimes things click completely outside of the, you know, beyond the, the, the frame of the, of the computer monitor. Um, so I can, I can certainly, uh, certainly relate to that. Um, so I, I guess to take up um, uh, Clemens's four, uh, you know, four uh, uh, aspects of storytelling. Um, framing, um, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in some sense, I was living the, you know, I had lived this book before I wrote it. Um, I wanted to write on this topic. I knew it fairly early. Um, and, um, and my desire to write about this um, was, of course, autobiographical, uh, stemmed from my own experiences. Um, this book, and the subject itself, when I'd go and present it in different places, uh, had two, over many years, two very different responses from audiences in the context about which I wrote. Um, that is, um, Russian colleagues would say, would approach it with radical recognition. And they would say, oh wait, what's new about it? Of course, that's our story. Sure, is this even history? That's about us. Um, and American colleagues would say, well, how is that possible? I would have never thought that this was happening in this time and place. I mean, that's very surprising. And so I, I came to this topic wanting to bridge uh, those two receptive modes. This isn't history. It's all recognizable. It's our lives. Or this is a very surprising history. Unimaginable. We would have never thought this took place. Um, and so that's uh, what went into that particular framing, uh, what went into that beginning. Um, I wanted to make it clear, simple, and stark. I was writing um, for an American audience, m at first mainly for an American audiences, uh, and I wanted, in some sense, to surprise them, to shock them, to say this did happen. Um, I'll probably have to come up with a different uh, beginning. Uh, if uh, this book and uh, translation is being prepared, uh, but might not appear, uh, if this book ever gets published in Russian, I'll probably start with this. You know the story. This is about you. You may not recognize it as history because this is part of your life. 
Um, and then I, I'd, lo I'd love to see what people would respond to that. Um, so that's the kind of the idea behind that, that uh, framing. Um, be uh, beginning. Um, I start every chapter, I try to. Um, I don't know how successful I am in doing so, but I try to start every chapter uh, by building on the previous one. It was very important for me to uh, do that for the sake of coherence because, again, uh, the, the documents were so very, um, very fragmented. Uh, they were so very, I in some sense, almost... Um, yeah, they, they, you know, they, they existed in so many different... Uh, emotional and factual registers um, that I had to impose in various rhetorical ways on the page, not only my ma imagination carrying the argument through, but in rhetorical ways I had to impose coherence. So I, I try to start every chapter by building on the ending of the previous one to carry that storyline forward. Um, cutting, I probably have more to say than, than anybody ever <laughs> wants to know. Um, I spent probably as much time, if not more, cutting than writing. Um, I wrote repetitively. Um, I cut and then wrote repetitively again. Um, I first cut uh, repetitive examples. Uh, to know where I had repetitive examples, I read the text aloud and did reverse outlining. So after everything is written, I outline again based on what is written to see where I'm being repetitive because I wasn't, it wasn't jumping at me. Um, so I cut repetitive examples. And then I cut repetitive citations. Um, and then I realized that cutting is not a mechanical uh, work. It's actually rewriting. Cuts produce gaps. You have to fill those gaps. Those gaps, when you fill, establish new connections. You have to make new transitions. You have to make things fit in a different way. That means rewriting the, sometimes rewriting the paragraphs entirely. Uh, and then I cut words. I, at the very end, I was going through the text and reading it aloud. And I think reading your own text aloud to yourself is important. Um, things jump out at you that, that you don't see when it's on the page. You need to hear it. Um, or I needed to hear it. Um, I so f of nearly every word I asked, is it necessary? Is it the only way I can express this idea or this story? If there are other ways, then it wasn't the right way to put it. Um, again, somebody else might have done a different job, might have found different words, uh, but at the end, I left the project feeling that this is the only way I can do it. Um, these are the only words I can use. Again, I ask that question, is this necessary? Is this the only um, kind of, um, unique way to state uh, my point? Um, and then ending. It's interesting, Max, that you said that um, you inserted yourself in the beginning. I inserted myself in the end. Um, after everything was, uh, was done and written, I felt that I felt that I constrained myself too much. I wanted to abandon all, and again, I didn't use the first the first person, um, but the epilogue is the only place uh, where I enmesh my own story with the story of my subjects. Um, and I felt that finally, after three some hundred pages, I I deserved the freedom to put myself into the story and to really let the reader know why I'm writing this. Um, so the epilogue is autobiographical, it's very personal, it's very intimate, uh, and doing so allowed me to think about the afterlife of the stories I'm telling um, and to take these stories uh, into the post-Soviet period and into immigration and in my own life straddles both the kind of the the post-Soviet life and life in, in diaspora. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the choice of where our personal biographies come in uh, is, is interesting, but, but it's important to, to I, I think, for everybody to know um, that, that your own life is inseparable from this, the, the book, the subjects, and the time period you work on. Beautiful. May I just make a brief comment on that? This deep insight on um, the story you have lived with this project, this story, for so many years. 
and it has shaped you. You shaped the story, but the story has also shaped you. It has become part of who you are. It reminds me, since we want to recognize the fact that Kyle Moore is Kyle Moore Abbey, and Abbey is Benedictine Abbey, uh, of the idea of the regular Benedicti. The regular of, of St. Benedict is not a rule that you just follow one by one. It's a rule that you live. You breathe the rule. It becomes so much part of who you are that you cannot live otherwise in a sense. And so there's this sense of that you don't only tell the story, but it's you who becomes the story, especially if you, if you spend so many years and uh, cul-de-sac and, and frustrations and risks and mistakes with, with building this story. So uh, any insights, Sage Mark, on, on framing, beginning, cutting and ending? Nothing but insights, Clement. <laughs> I, uh, um, my task was always to engage people uh, in the um, life and work uh, of a writer from a country which um, had ceased to exist uh, before I wrote a word, um, uh, who wrote in a language that had formerly ceased to exist, um, and who didn't have a very extensive readership in his own language, or its successor languages. Um, uh, he had passionate admirers, and there was a sense of significance around his work, which was widely felt at sort of higher, higher cultural levels, but, but it wasn't a mass readership, and, and, and very small Anglophone readership. So that's a, a sort of great prospectus, obviously, very tempting for publishers, two of whom said, no, thank you, um, uh, uh, good luck, you know. Um, so uh, how to tackle it? Well, you need formal structural solutions to that, to that question. And I, I, um, I found the solution in his own writing because he himself wanted to, wanted to tell universal stories. And all the minutiae and the specificities of his own identity, Hungarian, Jewish, Orthodox, Yugoslav, Montenegrin, uh, and so forth, all of those he was not interested in exploring for their own sake at all. He, he was profoundly uninterested, I would say, in, in, in going down that kind of avenue. He was looking for plots, for narratives, for for kind of fields of reference which would, which would communicate largely um, uh, about 20th century history, uh, about family, uh, about, about, let's say, um, uh, uh, the, the fate of individuals caught in what, what he called the, the clamor of history uh, and caught amid forces which threatened to overwhelm them. Um, so I... I needed to find a way of, of, um, of being true to his own story, his own biography, but, but lifting, lifting the narrative out of, out of that detail onto this largest plane of communications. And that was what I needed to find a solution to. Uh, so, so that for me was the framing problem, and, and also I, it, it was on my mind always when I was when I was writing it. Uh, um, uh, so I, I was alternating in, in a way, sometimes within a sentence, uh, um, uh, between that specificity and the universality. I mean, this is something which I think will be familiar to, you know, to, to, to many graduates. And maybe one word about cutting, Mark? Thank you. Um, well, cutting. Uh, Clemens, you spoke about the challenge of it, and I think you used the word trauma. Do cut that if he didn't use the word trauma. Oh my goodness, that's right, you did. Well, I uh, that 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 has that has not been my experience. N not only with this book, but with but with previous books. Uh, cutting cutting has been a pleasure. Uh, it is the stage at which my sense of the of the obligation to the reader becomes stronger. Uh, becomes is and is of, and is uppermost really. It, I feel it's guiding my hand. I I I am very happy to to remove you know sections to do the excisions. Uh, um, um, if I if I decide that the reader doesn't need it, the reader doesn't need it. Uh, th th this is this is exposition which 
which, which is not required. Now, it might be required to satisfy a, an examining committee for a dissertation, uh, and I see this in the dissertations that I, that I supervise uh, um, of, of my students, but readers don't need it. And um, it's, it is always a relief to return to, the, to the, my, my construction of, my anticipation of what the reader needs in terms of continuity. And it's much less than, it's, it's nearly always much less than I had thought they need. And, and one realizes that with relief and wields the red pen. Thank you so much. We are approaching the end of our time together here. And so uh, the wonderful exercise at the end is to invite each sage to give us just one sentence, advice you might want to give uh, to a graduate student. There is this genre, you know, all over the place, advice to a young investigator, this famous book by Santiago Ramón y Cajal from the late 19th century, advice to a young nurse, advice to a young peacemaker, advice to I don't know what. So um, maybe we start with Max, go to Mark and end with Eleonori. Uh, with this question, one sentence, what advice would you give to a graduate student? Brief, <laughs> <laughs> mm. You've taken on a very risky endeavor, so you should go for broke. Take care of the writing and the storytelling and in fact everything else, will take care of themselves. Um, I'd say that the experience of writing is humbling and it, I would suggest retaining that humility uh, both in this, you know, in this project, for future projects, and in future relationships. Thank you so much. That's why you're called Sages here. So we talked about generosity in writing. We talked about humility in writing. I would like to talk about gratitude at the end. I'm grateful to Eleonori, to Max, and to Mark for your real, I would call it wisdom. And, and there is a difference between the expert and the sage. And, and I, I thank you so much also for your deep personal knowledge that you shared in your experience with your wonderful and impressive books. We want to thank uh, Kyle Moore uh, for hosting us for this wonderful event. I want to thank my audience here, our graduate students, the colleagues from Notre Dame uh, that have listened to us and will provide a fiercely critical feedback. And obviously we want to thank uh, Laura and Mike Shannon and the Shannon family for uh, gifting the Laura Shannon Prize and and, and basically, that's the root of why we are here, uh, trying to understand uh, the uh, history of Europe in a more deeper uh, way that can stimulate new ways of thinking how we can live peacefully together. Thank you also to all those who made the technical aspects of this event possible. And uh, God bless you all and uh, be sages in the future. Thank you. <laughs>